Hello everyone, in human form here. I promise I'm working on another video for you all that will be much longer, coming out very soon. But until then, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything. And enjoy this video. Who we are influences how we see the world and how we decide to act. And as the world begins to grow increasingly complex, we struggle to find our place within it. This video will examine social complexity, chaos, and turbulence in the modern world through the lens of the great philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. I want you to be careful. I really of do. What? Of anything that can of hit what? you. Of anything that can hit you. Look at of all the stuff. What? Of this. Of what? Of this. Do it look like I'm scared? No. no. I don't care if you live or not. Okay. But Get away from here with all that media shit that y'all doing. Right now. Look. We're with CNN. Then We're take live. that camera all the way to up there. Then. We are Revolutionary ideas, rising tensions, and chaotic events are progressively complicating our world. In the social sphere, individuals differ in their reactions to these social phenomena. In doing so, we have individuality, diversity, and subjectivity. We categorize individuals into different sects, such as Christians, Keynesians, scientists, angry people, rich people, and many others. These divisions of mankind seem arbitrary until they are not. In the face of turmoil, we tend to react in ways where we point out the people in blame, the people who try and help, and the people who hide away. Friedrich Nietzsche had his own view on how to divide mankind during troubling times. He wrote about three categories of man, the man of Rousseau, the man of Goethe, and the man of Schopenhauer. The first of the three was the violent revolutionary, passionate, fierce, and aware of injustice around them, injustice that was always present. This is the downtrodden man that rose up and made the Soviet Union, that refused war in Vietnam, that opposes modern day injustices, whatever they may be. We see the man of Rousseau both in the left and the right as individuals who fight for what they think is right and against what they deem to be evil. The evangelical right or the protesting left. What is always present is an enemy to what is good. This is one of a number of protests across the country, but this one is by far the largest. Arbitrary and unconstitutional overreach has destroyed my career. Black lives matter! I say I don't believe your science because I believe my God. Today's demonstrations were clearly a direct challenge to those rules. This good for the Rousseau man, Nietzsche tells, comes from the yearning for purity manifested thus in nature yet in doing so abandons himself and is thus lost in desperation. For us, perhaps the factions of our day fight a futile cause, or perhaps lose themselves in their own maze in search for an ever distant primordial utopia. The second of the three, the man of Goethe, is a contemplative soul who at times is at the top of our social ladders. Instead of viewing the world as unjust, he views the world as necessary, rich in value and sufficient. There is no will to change it, rather it is a piece of art to be observed. We will find these people at our universities, our news, and sometimes our politicians the professor who teaches age-old knowledge, who speaks of what happened when, and takes no immediate action to the lessons that he seems to reiterate, is seemingly the perfect archetype of the man of Goethe. Political theorist Hannah Arendt's own criticism of the contemplative tradition of various thinkers draws parallels to this. As the man of passivity and inertia stand only as statues to an unkind world. Is zwischen Philosophie und Politik eine Spannung gibt, nämlich zwischen dem Menschen insofern er ein philosophierendes und dem Menschen insofern er ein handelndes Wesen ist. Eine Spannung gibt, die es in diesem Sinne, sagen wir, bei Naturphilosophie nicht gibt. Der Philosoph steht der Natur gegenüber, 
eigentlich wie alle anderen Menschen auch. Wenn er darüber denkt, spricht er im Namen der ganzen Menschheit. Er steht nicht neutral der Politik gegenüber, seit Plato nicht. The newscaster, who has reported what has happened, yet takes no personal disgust at the atrocities that come out of their mouth, also brings forth the carelessness of this type. The politician as well, who despite all the outcries, deems the world is fine. Both are guilty of these traits. Speaking without any prepared script or notes, Clinton told the soldiers that the hard work begins now, and that the job of implementing the peace accords will not be without risks. The third man is the man of Schopenhauer. The man who admits the world's faults, bravely so, yet knows the deep futility in trying to change it as well. With this truth comes their suffering, and in their self-sacrifice, the man of Schopenhauer is not lost like the man of Rousseau, or guilty like the man of Goethe, but is completely abolished in his own pride, as his courage seeps away blind fury, and yet, also called neutrality. We rarely find this today, as society has grown increasingly divided and angered at one another. Except maybe the occasional cynic or comedian who exalts a few of these traits. In Nietzsche's vision, perhaps we need a new generation of people willing to turn away the Rousseaus and Goethes within them and embrace the asceticism that is the man of Schopenhauer. <laughs>